Good evening. I'm Hugh Hewitt, the president of the Nixon Foundation, and welcome to the November 2021 meeting of the Nixon Seminar, chaired by former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and former National Security Advisor to the President Ambassador Robert O'Brien. We're down a couple of seminar members tonight with two abroad and Christopher Cox doing election night. But the question for the evening is, how has the national security situation of the United States changed in the one year since the presidential election of 2020? I asked Monica Crowley if she would uh, tee us up tonight. Monica. Huge. Thank you very much. And it's great to see everybody tonight on this election night. Um, I thought that I would give a broad overview, a very brief but broad overview of where we were a year ago versus where we are today. And then I'll turn it back over to Hugh so everybody else can weigh in. I think that if we think about the change in the national security posture of the United States, it can basically be summed up as from America first to America <laughs> last, from American strength to American weakness, and from peace and stability to conflict and chaos. Last year, despite the pandemic, America's preeminence had been restored, and we were using our extraordinary power politically, economically, diplomatically, culturally, to bring about greater stability and peace. And all of these successes that we are going to talk about tonight are a direct result of the leadership of President Trump, Secretary Pompeo, and Ambassador O'Brien. So thank you, gentlemen. Let's remind us ourselves of where we were one year ago, which seems both yesterday and, and an eternity ago. So a year ago, the Trump administration had delivered historic peace agreements in the Middle East, changing the regional dynamic in very real ways that cultivated economic and, and other kinds of cooperation that in turn is really engendering stable peace. It had successfully pushed back against China's adventurism in the South China Sea and the Pacific Rim more broadly. It had successfully contained Russia's adventurism in its sphere and slowed the gift of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. It had successful diplomacy underway to contain North Korea's uh, nuclear ambitions. It had withdrawn from the catastrophic JCPOA with Iran and was using its extensive sanctions authority to contain it. It had realigned our relationship with our NATO allies, getting them to contribute their agreed upon freight to enjoy the benefits of that alliance. It had successfully negotiated fairer trade deals with China, our North American free trade partners, South Korea and Japan, among others. It had begun to modernize and rebuild our military, left hollowed out by the Obama-Biden administration. This is just a partial list of the Trump administration's stunning international achievements, which are now all in jeopardy because of a new administration that believes in reversing much of what the Trump team did, either out of policy differences or out of spite or both. Keep in mind that the new administration's grand strategy, to the extent that it exists, is to redistribute everything American, our power, wealth, resources, our military and diplomatic advantage, economic competitiveness, our leadership, our borders, and yes, our very unique exceptionalism. Just in the last 10 months, America has lost a tremendous amount of power, credibility, and prestige. Most of that is due to the catastrophic withdrawal from Afghanistan, of course, but it's also coming from the overall pandering and apologias, retrenchment, and multilateral groveling coming from the Biden administration. American weakness is destabilizing, and it is a provocation. That's why America's enemies are now emboldened as they probe and advance and threaten us and our interests around the world. The southern border is a dangerous free-for-all of unchecked illegal immigration. The defeat in Afghanistan has created a power vacuum into which we have seen the Taliban uh, enter ISIS, Al-Qaeda, China, Iran, Pakistan, and, and so on. It's also made our homeland more vulnerable to terrorist attacks, particularly when coupled with the wide open southern border. Iran is marching toward a nuclear weapon. 
Russia enjoys a free hand now to engage in energy extortion of our European allies, thanks to Biden's acquiescence to Nord Stream 2. China remains unaccountable on everything from the origins of COVID-19 to its threats to Taiwan, to its increasingly aggressive behavior in the Pacific and beyond, to its widespread human rights abuses. They have also crippled domestic energy production, sending Biden begging to OPEC and other hostile foreign energy producing regimes, making us more vulnerable to energy extortion as well. So policy matters. And unfortunately, I think we've only begun to see the very dangerous consequences from this shift in policy from the successes that came from American strength in the Trump administration to the failures coming from this administration and America's weaknesses. So on that happy note, I will turn it over to Hugh. Thank you, Dr. Crowley. Alex Wong. Wonderful, thanks Hugh, thanks everyone. Good to see everybody. You know, I, I, I thought a little bit about the topic tonight and you know, I wanna kind of just briefly touch on something that I think will inform a lot of the comments tonight and something that, that Monica touched on as well. Uh, which is, you know, the fact that since last year, I think very rapidly it's become clear that China has, has made a choice. It's made a choice to be very upfront about its policy of confrontation and its policy and its, its vision of, of revising the international order, something that it hadn't really done before. It always tried to hide the ball. It always tried to perhaps straddle, um, uh, you know, a kind of a, a softer face to the world while having some strategic ambitions hidden. But I think what's become really clear is they've uh, begun a political consolidation at home, sometimes at the expense of their, their economic uh, uh, potency. They've begun uh, making very aggressive and assertive demands, political demands abroad. And they've made very clear the, their investments in conventional as well as nuclear military hardware to back up the, that uh, political consolidation at home and the demands abroad. Um, you know, the reasons for this are, are debated. It, it could be that the political exigencies of their the Communist Party centennial required this, this type of move. It could be that Xi Jinping senses that uh, he is now on the downslope of a demographic or economic trend where he has to consolidate these gains uh, now or he's not going to ever. Uh, but whatever the reason, uh, this, this choice, this clear choice by, by China, I think is sharpening some of the challenges in various hotspots around the world for the United States, but as well as for our partners in the free world. Um, I wanna touch on just one uh, that, that I worked on together with many on, on this, on this, in the seminar, uh, and that's the, D the DPRK. You know, to take a step back, when President Trump um, pursued his, his diplomatic outreach to Kim Jong-un uh, from the Singapore summit on, there were a couple of factors there that made, uh, made it possible that we would have a breakthrough with North Korea, or at least uh, create a, 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 a situation of stability. Number one was the crushing sanctions that we were able to get together uh, with our partners at the United Nations. Number two um, was that we had a president who was unorthodox, who was willing to, to, to shake up the, the strategic chessboard and use his political capital to do that in North Korea or, or in the Korean Peninsula. But third, we, we had a, a united world behind our diplom diplomacy. Uh, and in, in, at least in part, we had China's at least curiosity, if not full buy-in on that, uh, that effort. China was, was taken aback, I think, May, was unsettled by uh, US, uh, the US uh, and, and President Trump's policy in North Korea. They were unsettled by the, the missile tests, the nuclear tests by North Korea. Uh, and they saw uh, perhaps an opportunity here uh, to, to deal with what, what is a nuisance on their border. Uh, so they assisted us. But I think in, since last year, we've seen China make a different choice. They've made a different turn. We've seen them give de facto sanctions relief to North Korea through failing to enforce the UN sanctions on North Korea. We've seen, seen them give aid to North Korea. And I don't think it's too much speculation that uh, China is encouraging, at least this is my theory, is encouraging Pyongyang to try to split the ROK off from the United States by pushing uh, the DPRK to ask for sanctions relief, uh, separate from negotiations and separate from substantive steps on denuclearization. So I, I put this out there because this makes the challenge harder. Um, 
And it makes clear that China is, is looking at the peninsula not as an area where we can cooperate to resolve a challenge that does threaten the entire world, but as another um, uh, uh, kind of playing field for its, its strategic, its strate grander strategic designs. And that's not a surprise. You know, when, when China feels it is under threat around its periphery or it's under threat from across the world, it has historically uh, draw, drawn closer to it its traditional allies. And really, it's only true ally, it's only treaty ally in, in North Korea. So this makes that, that issue harder. That makes that challenge harder. Uh, it doesn't make it impossible, um, but it will, it will take uh, some creative diplomacy and perhaps some harder diplomacy and harder action on our part, as well as the part of our allies in, in the region uh, to unstick that problem. But I'll stop there because I know there's uh, some other comments uh, to, to be had here, but I appreciate seeing everyone tonight. Thank you, Alex. Let's stay with the Alex category and go to Alex Gray. Thanks, Hugh. And uh, I really appreciate uh, Monica's opening remarks. I thought that laid out a lot of the concerns I'm sure many of us on here have about the direction things have taken the last uh, nine months. But I'm, I'm actually going to confine my remarks to a little bit uh, a little different approach um, and talk a little bit about what I think the last nine months revealed about continuity and consensus in American foreign policy, and, and particularly in two ways. Uh, one, Alex touched on as it relates to China policy, and China being the organizing principle of U.S. national security. And, and I think we saw that embraced uh, in documents and in actions by the Biden administration. And that was, of course, a, a complete carryover from how President Trump approached the issue from his national security strategy on down. But I think what will be President Trump's greatest legacy, and that's part of part of it is is related to China and part of it's beyond that, is the, the maxim economic security is national security. And uh, Nadia Shadlow doesn't seem like she's with us tonight, but you know, she very eloquently put this into the uh, national security strategy. And it's one of the first lines in President Trump's in SS, and it continued on into the interim national security strategic guidance of the Biden administration. Uh, and it's been borne out through a number of policies. And I think this is a sea change uh, that President Trump inaugurated in how we think about the, the intersection of economics and security policy. And in a lot of ways, it, it's been perpetuated. And so everything from the focus on the supply chain, some of the executive orders that are, are coming out of, of the White House and out of the Defense Department, some of the, the policies coming out of the Defense Department, focus on uh, actions like the Jones Act that protect our maritime industry and the continuation of that coming out of this administration, um, continuing to, to have a more nuanced view of trade policy that, that looks not just at the foreign policy benefits of our trade policy, but also at the impact of our trade policy on the industrial base in the United States, both from a jobs and, and livelihood standpoint, but also from a defense industrial standpoint. And you can go on down the list in terms of specific policies that the Biden team has been pursuing that very much mirror what's come out of the Trump administration. Buy America is another one where they've actually, in many instances, built upon and even strengthened the emphasis on Buy America, uh, in implementation of Buy America legislation that the Trump administration was very passionate about. So I, I think what we've learned looking back in the last nine months, while Monica laid out a lot of very real concerns we all have, one of the, what I would say, positive outcomes has been a, a realization that there, there really is not a large uh, divergence on this question of the intersection of economics and security and the need to strengthen our domestic industrial base to deal with a rising, a risen China, to deal with long-term great power competition with the PRC. And I, I think that's going to be a, a feature of Washington policy discussion uh, over the next at least decade, if not more. And uh, we can thank President Trump for having inaugurated that and the Biden administration for having wisely continued that focus. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Let's stay in the NSC veterans. Uh, Matt Pottinger, please. Are you muted, Matt? Okay, I think here we you, are. Sorry, here you are. Yeah. Good. So, uh, just to, to add to all the all the good remarks so far, I think that that you know is with respect to China policy, like Alex uh, Gray just mentioned, there is there is a significant degree of continuity that we saw from the end of the Trump administration rolling into the Biden administration, where there wasn't a, any attempt to 
proactively roll back uh, a lot of the things that we had uh, uh, put in place. But uh, we're now 10 months into an administration where, uh, frankly, with this great power competition that we're in with China, level steady flight is not going to get us to where we need to go. We've got to actually uh, have an appetite for imposing costs, additional costs for uh, things that are damaging our national interest. And we need to accept short-term costs in order to have long-term uh, stability and prosperity. So what, what I would really like to see is that, is that appetite uh, that uh, that President Trump on down, uh, Secretary Pompeo, other other cabinet officers were were willing to take those critical steps. I'll give an example. <clears throat> you know, uh, we we knew <clears throat> that the Chinese consulate in Houston uh, was highly problematic because of um, uh, espionage that was taking place and other activities in the sort of gray zone of recruiting people working in our sensitive labs. Uh, and uh, the president, uh, with Secretary Pompeo's and, Bra and Ambassador O'Brien's advice, um, said that uh, you know the actions that, that China's undertaking are unacceptable. We think that it's important to accept some cost and impose some cost by closing that down. The, the upshot of that was that China scrambled to uh, evacuate um, roughly, you know, according to the Department of Justice, a thousand. Uh, uh, officers, PLA officers, who were working undercover in the United States or were working uh, in w with either, uh, uh, you know, uh, false false visas where they had disavowed uh, the, the fact that they were actually uh, affiliated with the People's Liberation Army. Those people were evacuated. That was an example of, of imposing costs and accepting some short-term costs in order to actually uh, achieve, uh, you know, greater security, economic security, national security, defense security for the United States. So where we are now, you're starting to see what I fear was, is some kind of a divergence within the Biden administration between those on the economic side uh, of the administration who just want to continue with business as usual uh, and, and those more national security minded officials who realize that we're in the, in the competition of our lives and that, that we're going to have to start Start imposing a greater cost. We're going to have to start cutting off the flow of capital that is going into China's technology sector when the Chinese technology sector is part of a military civil fusion with their military. All of everything that we invest, every bit of technology we give China uh, is uh, potentially legally obligated to flow to the People's Liberation Army as well as to the national security apparatus, the internal surveillance apparatus of China. So it's unacceptable that, that we're not taking proactive steps to defend our technology, frustrate China's own uh, efforts to try to uh, leapfrog ahead of us in autonomous systems and artificial intelligence, quantum computing, uh, biotechnology and the like. So um, uh, that, that's really, uh, I, I think that attitude of, of imposing costs, accepting short-term costs, accepting a certain amount of risk in the relationship is, is uh, what we really need to see more of now. Thank you, Matt. Jonathan Burks. Did I, did I lose Jonathan? I believe I lost Jonathan. All right. Then let me go on to uh, John Noonan. Hey, thanks, Hugh. And um, it pleases me to be the first to say that uh, I, I've seen my first announcement in the Virginia governor's race. He may be uh, getting a little ahead of himself, but I've seen one respected pundit uh, and data guy call it for Glenn Youngkin. So I know that makes the Virginians among us it certainly uh, does. Ha happy campers. And I'm sorry to pollute your good foreign policy event with uh, uh, with po politics, Hugh, but you know me, I can't resist. Um, I'd like to to just continue on the theme of the 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 past year, and I think it's it's probably a little unfair to um, to make hasty conclusions about the overall success or uh, failure of the Biden foreign policy this early on. Um, yeah, you know, they're barely manned at the State Department. Diplomacy takes time. Um, the criticism is coming, but I want to at least caveat and not be unfair as I dunk mercilessly on. Uh, on the uh, the Biden foreign policy, and for what I think is good reason, um, I think you can um, I think you can summarize it in a lack of focus, or at least uh, a mis uh, a series of misplaced priorities. 
uh, you saw the first several months um, th they moved quickly on things like a clean start extension from the rush for um, for the Russians for I know everyone on on the call here knows what start is but for if you're listening in and you're not familiar with the treaty it's a strategic strategic arms reduction treaty limits nuclear weapons and provides for on the ground inspections um, in both the US and uh, Russian Federation uh, uh, for both their nuclear arsenals. Um, that was a tremendous win for Vladimir Putin, and they followed that up quickly with um, a lifting of sanctions on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. That's a natural gas pipeline uh, from Russia to eastern Germany. It was a big project of Angela Merkel, uh, and um, the, my understanding is the pipeline has been completed, but gas is not flowing yet, but should be soon. Uh, the concern is amongst not just uh, conservatives and Republican uh, American foreign policy types, but many NATO allies as well, is that that's, this is going to allow the Russians to essentially hold the continent uh, hostage using energy prices, a very effective form of, uh, of coercion um, at that, as I think many Americans are seeing and experiencing with the price of gasoline at the pumps themselves, um, just how effective of an economic um, tool uh, uh, that can be. Um, of course, and then I, I think we're probably without going down the full list, like the elephant in the room, of course, is Afghanistan. Uh, we we burned a lot of oxygen on that. I think uh, good oxygen at that uh, in the last session. But I think it's fair to say that whether you were for leaving a small presence behind or whether you were um, you were more of an absolutist and felt we should um, leave immediately and leave absolutely. Uh, America was humiliated, and I think Americans don't particularly like that. And if if you have widespread opposition to uh, popular opposition to your foreign policy, I think it's difficult to uh, characterize it as a success, particularly if um, there was no meaningful uh, gain made out of it. And what we've seen is we've seen a res uh, an Al Qaeda that will be able to reconstitute itself far quicker uh, than we had a than original IC estimates had provided for. General Milley said in testimony earlier uh, this month that it could be as little as a half a year before Al Qaeda and uh, ISIS could reconstitute and um, uh, and threaten U.S. interests or threaten Americans in the homeland. Um, and you know, we have no reason to suspect um, you know that timeline could not be even accelerated further. Um, so this is all in the theme of misplaced priorities, getting, you know, the, the, the big things out of the way, what I thought were bad decisions, uh, Afghanistan, Nord Stream, uh, start. And you see it paves the way for what they really seem to care about is things like Paris climate deal and resurrecting that, uh, renewing the Iran nuclear deal, which was a failed, um, which was a failed program under the, the Trump administration's great credit, um, uh, left that bad deal. Um, and uh, it, I think what's particularly concerning on the um, on the climate side is that it feels like um, just watching the actions of uh, former Secretary Kerry and his statements that climate is the most important diplomatic priority that the Biden administration has for China to the point where it undercuts real strategic uh, diplomatic, economic, and military competition. Uh, with China. Um, if that is indeed the highest priority, then I think uh, we've got a problem uh, because the, the China problem is immediate. It's now. It's not something that could be mitigated like climate change by engineering and technological innovation, although that's certainly um, a small dynamic of the, the U.S.-China um, Cold War, if you want to use um, that term. Uh, so, that's um that's a lot in nine months, and I don't think that the the weather vane is necessarily um, pointing or blowing in the right direction, just in terms of our U in terms of U.S. national security interests. Um, I will give them credit. Uh, I thought that the uh, submarine deal that they signed with um, the the United Kingdom and Australia providing for nuclear-powered submarines um, to the Australian government, which has a world-class submarine service, um, was a good, it, it was a good deal. It was bungled. They obviously isolated the French and restoring, what they said, restoring relations with our NATO allies was a, uh, a, top, uh, a top priority, though. So you could say that actually undercut one of their priorities. But 
it was it was fundamentally a good deal. And I think um, the the AI, the shared AI and quantum computing component of that uh, deal is not something that can be um, overlooked. That's just as important as having eight nuclear powered submarines in the water and the uh, ostensibly in the South China Sea. Um, I'll finish with this, um, something that is both concerning to me as a, a veteran of the Air Force and um, concerning to my boss, Senator Cotton, is uh, a series of misplaced priorities, much like the foreign policy on the Defense Department. Uh, we hear from rank and file sergeants and majors and captains and colonels every day uh, saying, look, I, I've never been more demoralized than I am right now. The, the Biden administration is dumping all this superfluous crap uh, down our throats, whether it be, um, you know, now I have to focus on climate change just as much as I focus on China. Uh, I have this very controversial counter extremism training, which um, some of you may have read about in the media. Uh, it only focuses on uh, so called right wing extremism versus all forms of extremism. And then um, while everyone agrees that um, the, the military should be open and an even playing field for all Americans, regardless of your uh, race, sex, gender, uh, what have you, um, the, there has been a unhealthy, um, what I would characterize as an obsession over diversity, equity, inclusion to the point where uh, we are not promoting the best people, we're promoting officers based on race. And this is, uh, this is fundamentally contributing to a, a military that is not as focused, not as determined, not training as hard, um, not concentrated uh, on the threat as much as our Chinese and Russian adversaries who focus 100% of their training time on killing Americans. Uh, I think to put it in a crude term, you put it in a sports analogy, if you have two football teams on a field and one of them trains 70% of the time to win the big game and the other one trains 100% of the time to win the big game, it's going to be the one that trains 100% of the time that has the Vegas odds on it. Um, that has got to change. I think it's going to take um, congressional leadership to do it. Uh, which means we're going to have to take back both chambers. But I have uh, rambled enough and hopefully didn't depress anyone too much uh, in the process. Thanks, you. Thank you, John. Uh, since you mentioned congressional leadership, let's move to our abrasive congressman. Congressman Gallagher. I'll try not to be abrasive. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the Biden administration came in with a desire to resuscitate the Iran deal, which was dead or dying, and was mugged by Iranian political reality, which has thus far prevented them from doing that, thankfully. And then on China, I very much agree with the sentiment that um, there is a shocking amount of continuity uh, between the previous administration and the current one. And I think that's a testament to the work of Secretary Pompeo, National Security Advisor O'Brien, as well as Deputy National Security Advisor Pottinger. Um, you saw the, uh, the uh, U.S. Trade Representative, for example, say they are going to not rescind the, the Section 301 trade investigation. Uh, you saw them not completely get rid of the uh, DOD's Communist Chinese Military Companies list, but rather amend it. In some cases, not quite great, but expand it in other areas. But by and large, I think on China, the administration is undecided and beset by two competing factions, uh, one of which has a more realistic view of China and recognizes that there is no going back to the status quo ante. There is no going back to the status quo pre-Trump. Um, we have to have a more competitive relationship. But the other faction is that led by former Secretary of State John Kerry, and that is the climate change uh, evangelist faction, and that sort of naturally leads you into a more cooperative relationship with the CCP, which I think would be naive and misguided. And I agree with everything that John Noonan said. I, I actually think that wing in some ways is ascendant. And given the overarching focus on climate change, which I expect to be reflected in the national security strategy, as well as the national defense strategy, I think that could be very problematic for the administration. That being said, the three biggest changes, in my opinion, uh, the first is most obvious, and Noonan touched on this as well, uh, the Afghanistan debac debacle. Uh, even if you were a proponent of getting out of Afghanistan, I'm not sure how you could defend the ham-handed way in which this administration 
conducted the withdrawal. Uh, I do think that is going to have a negative effect on our deterrent posture in other regions of the world. I think it is causing allies to question the credibility of U.S. commitments. I think it is emboldening the Chinese Communist Party to test uh, America, particularly within the Taiwan scenario. And I think that will be a perhaps unrecoverable error for the Biden administration. The second thing I would say, uh, uh, Matt Pottinger mentioned the need to uh, crack down on the outflow of U.S. capital to China. And it is remarkable that China is probably going to set a, set a record this year in terms of foreign direct investment, even after a coronavirus pandemic that emerged from China. Uh, U.S. capital continues to flow into China tech, into Chinese technology companies that are abetting genocide, uh, defense-adjacent companies. It's remarkable to me. But I actually think <laughs> perhaps the biggest thing that has happened that may stop that Ironically, is action that General Secretary Xi Jinping himself has taken in terms of his crackdown on Didi, the ride-sharing company in China, uh, as well as his torpedoing of the Ant Financial IPO. I think more than anything else, that has sent a signal to Wall Street in America that it is just as a fiduciary matter, it is not wise to continue to invest money in China. But we'll see if they get that message. And I do think there's a growing divide between financial elites uh, and national security professionals in America uh, when it comes to investing in China. And the final thing I'd say, uh, and I'd be curious if um, my friends who served in the previous administration agree, I actually think one of the biggest changes between where we were a year ago and today is the fact that the lab leak hypothesis which was once derided as a crazy conspiracy theory that uh, Robert O'Brien was cooking up in his basement somewhere, uh, is now the most likely hypothesis to explain the outbreak of the pandemic. And there is an overwhelming amount of evidence that suggests that. And they, that's having a real impact on Capitol Hill. As much as the Democrats are trying to ignore it, uh, as much as they refuse to subpoena key actors, that is absolutely critical. If for no other reason, then it will help us to prevent the next pandemic, as well as give us a greater understanding of the nature of the regime we are dealing with in the Chinese Communist Party. So those are the three things that I would highlight. Thank you, Congressman. Congressman Michael Waltz. <laughs> Hey, thank you, Hugh. Good to be with everybody. Uh, I don't I have a few things to add. I think it's more points of, uh, of emphasis uh, to everyone's great comments. Um, and I may just add a few things that we're working on from a congressional perspective that is a bit different. But I think in terms of the change uh, in the last year, it's certainly been a change uh, from the previous administration. But frankly, it's really more of the same from the Obama administration or what I've started to call the O'Biden um, team. I mean, it's the it's the same team, you know, Blinken, uh, Austin, Sullivan, Finer. I mean, all the number two, threes and fours are now on the number you know, one, two and threes. And I think Obama really captured it best in his their underlying philosophy towards foreign policy in his second inaugural speech when he said, we're going to reach out a hand to the world rather than a fist. Uh, and I think that's whether that's their approach in Vienna to the Iran deal, uh, the approach to the Taliban. I mean, we can really go around the world where it's how can we get people to the table through concessions uh, and, um, and frankly, through appeasement. Uh, and, and hopefully, if we are kind enough, the rest of the world will be kind back. And I think anybody who's served uh, around the world <laughs> understands that's not, um, that's not how our adversaries think. Uh, I, I do, of course, we, we, uh, Noonan's right. We spent some time on Afghanistan last time. Uh, just to update, I received, you know, I've received a series of briefings since then. I think we're in a period very similar to where we were in between 2011 and 2014, when we went to zero in Iraq. 
uh, left no residual capability there. Uh, and, and not long after, the analysts watching it closely began beating the drum of, uh, of the rising uh, threat and the reconstituting al-Qaeda that we all know then turned into ISIS. We're already seeing that. I think in many ways, uh, candidly, the intelligence community is starting to kind of cover uh, their rear end, cover their six, so to speak, and make sure that it is known that the assessments are out there uh, uh, so that they, they can't be blamed later for an intelligence failure because we're getting them loud and clear that the, uh, the threat to the homeland, the cancer that is terrorism in Afghanistan is spreading. Uh, and I think from an oversight perspective, that's something we're going to have to watch very closely and make sure we don't have a similar scandal uh, to what we had um, that Mike Pompeo knows quite well to what we had do down in CENTCOM, uh, where analysts, uh, we had a number of whistleblower analysts who were trying to raise the alarm uh, about the rising ISIS. Uh, and uh, that they found out that wasn't very good for their career, it wasn't very welcome through their chain of command because it wasn't welcome in the White House. And of course, the commander at that time was then General Austin and now Secretary Austin. Uh, so I think we're in that same dangerous period. My question, as I asked a number of the, of the administration folks coming over, is how bad do we let it get? How loud will the red, you know, will the alarm bells ring? How red will the alarm uh, lights be? You know, do we before we take some type, before we reverse course and take some type of meaningful action. Uh, and that's really unclear what those tripwires are, what those thresholds are uh, in terms of dangers to the homeland. I, frankly, I don't think have been defined uh, because there's an obvious recalcitrance uh, across, the, across the administration to admit that maybe this wasn't the right policy road to go down. That's really that's really disturbing. The other piece is one of the biggest uh, one of the biggest drivers and uh, and kind of top line reasons uh, for the drawdown to zero was to be able to shift to the Indo Pacific and be able to focus our assets, which I think rightly to our greatest threat uh, is the CCP. But yet we're already seeing assets have to shift back from the Indo Pacific back into CENTCOM to be able uh, to do the much harder job of monitoring the growing terror threat from abroad. Uh, so while the Air Force wanted to uh, minimize its ISR fleet and shift to fourth and fifth gen fighters, they're now going to have to reinvest in ISR because we're going to need that many more orbits uh, to fly from so far away. And a number of our other clandestine assets are having to shift uh, because we have nothing on the ground that could have done this, I think, much more uh, cheaply and efficiently. Uh, and that's just a sad irony. On the China piece, uh, you know, Gallagher and I uh, attended a, a meeting today that I thought was really illustrative um, uh, and kind of the financial services world. I don't see, um, I, I, I just don't see that much changing. Frankly, in the non-military piece, um, I would have thought that the, the recent hypersonic launch, which uh, should be, I, I believe, is a Sputnik moment. Uh, I was out in Spacecom and NORAD uh, receiving the detailed briefings the week before it went public. Uh, and I can tell you their hair is on fire, as it should be. But when you shift over, I, and this is, I see, really, my mission, Gallagher's mission, and, and others who see this threat clearly in the public space is continuing to explain this to the American people of why this is uh, such a problem. But when you see our debt spending uh, that will continue to be out of control, knowing that the Chinese theory of victory is us just being able to not be able to afford to compete. When you see Larry Fink at BlackRock encouraging our, his investors to triple uh, their investment into China. When you see things in the Build Back Better plan, uh, for example, one of the provisions will close our largest copper mine uh, that, uh, that the company has invested billions into because it's sitting on public lands. Uh, and then, you know, we're already seeing advertisement for the Genocide Olympics. Uh, and you're going to see this spot, the, you know, the sponsors and others uh, turn a blind eye very publicly uh, uh, and and really provide a platform for uh, Z's propaganda 
uh, machine. Uh, you know, I'm just I'm just not optimistic that the whole of government non-military pieces uh, are are falling into place. Uh, from cutting off capital to bringing our supply chains home to reducing our dependencies on critical minerals. I would um, I would give one bit of good news uh, that I think between endless frontiers uh, and the House version of the National the Science Foundation a reauthorization, there is a bipartisan drive to invest into STEM and to invest into some of these critical research areas. Uh, I'm the ranking member on research and technology, and we were able to get some important security provisions in, things that I would think most Americans would think were common sense, uh, like the security office there being able to ask for any contracts and actually review the contracts that any researcher or professor has entered into. But I think we've given them some important tools and you know, literally quadrupled the amount of resources they have in those security offices and those inspector generals. In the National Science Foundation, they've received a thousand percent increase in referrals from the FBI uh, just in the last two years. Um, and then I, I, I would be remiss as a Floridian uh, to not mention Cuba and just what a missed opportunity in our own hemisphere. That wasn't just a change from this year, that was a generational opportunity uh, of those brave souls that put their lives and their whole family's lives on the line to make a stand. And they didn't even get so much as a speech uh, from this White House, much less garnering the international community, the Organization of American States, the UN, uh, and others to really rally around uh, those brave souls and to condemn uh, the Cuban regime. They got nothing. They got basically a written statement. Uh, and and uh, that's just a shame. Uh, that's, uh, I think, frankly, sad, but it is also not going to bode well for this administration politically uh, uh, in, in Florida. I think it's going to solidify a lot of the shift that we've seen between the socialist policies that are trying to move through the Congress right now, uh, though they keep tripping on themselves, and that lack of action uh, against the Cuban regime. All right, with that, I'll stop. Thank you, Congressman. Now to our co-chairs. That's seven dire assessments, Ambassador <laughs> O'Brien. Uh, you get to pick that up, and then I'll go to Secretary Pompeo. Well, thank you, Hugh. Uh, it's great to be here with everyone. Uh, let me start by just uh, uh, commending uh, Monica on, on that tour de force of an introduction that uh, that wasn't uh, wasn't pretty, but uh, was eloquent. So thank you for uh, for getting us started. Uh, let me also uh, just just before we get started, I'd like to uh, uh, extend some condolences to uh, the, the family of, of General Powell, and uh, he was the 16th National Security Advisor, and and uh, I succeeded him. He was the Secretary of State, and Mike succeeded him. A great American, didn't always agree on on politics, but. Uh, he was an example of integrity and, uh, and and service for the country. So Alma, his wife, and his kids, uh, you know, have our uh, our condolences. And uh, and I didn't want to let let a night of the Nixon seminar where we've we've celebrated past National Security Advisors uh, uh, go without mentioning uh, General Powell. Uh, so uh, let let me start with uh, with China. And uh, look, I think the. Uh, uh, We've got a couple of things happening, and I, I thought Alex Wong's comments were an excellent analysis setting the stage. I think uh, Alex Gray was right talking about continuity. Uh, what worries me about continuity is something that, that Matt pointed out and, and uh, Mike Gallagher uh, echoed, and that is I think at the, the, the senior level, I think the Jake Sullivan, Tony Blink, and even Lloyd Austin level, uh, and I understand from you know Congressman Waltz that those are Obama veterans, but uh, th they do seem to understand the threat that we're under. What concerns me are the levels down at, uh, at two, three, four, and five, uh, where there, there doesn't seem to be that same commitment and uh, that same understanding of the, of the threat, the, the generational threat that, that Mike uh, Pompeo pointed out in his speech at the Nixon Library uh, last summer and that I pointed out and Bill Barr and Chris Ray and the Vice President and the President all pointed out in their speeches. So, so I think it's, it's a, a thin layer of of continuity, uh, but, but there's always the threat of it being undermined, especially when someone throws out uh, climate. So I, I, I think that there are, uh, you know, I, I, in fact, I'm sure there are people in the administration that would gladly trade uh, uh, Taiwan's uh, independence and, and freedom for uh, three less coal plants in 2045. And uh, we've got to make sure that that sort of deal, you know, never, never happens and, and that climate doesn't drive that. 
I think we've got a window uh, that we need to be extraordinarily concerned about uh, from the, the end of the Beijing Olympics. I, I don't think that Xi Jinping will uh, do anything untoward or, or create too much of a problem with Taiwan uh, prior to the Olympics. D dictators love the Olympics. Uh, it's been a long, uh, at least the modern Olympics, and everyone do anything to undermine them. Uh, but I, I, I think after the Olympics and, and prior to the next presidential election, I said this to Nikkei the other day in an interview with the Japanese paper, that they're concerned about a President Pompeo, a President Trump uh, taking office as a China hawk in 20, January 2025. And, and so I could see Xi Jinping looking at that window between the Olympics and the, uh, uh, the, the next presidential election as an opportunity to uh, uh, be, begin a very course of campaign against Taiwan, if not an invasion. Uh, on the defense front, my three highest priorities as National Security Advisor were number one, you know, hypersonics by a mile. Uh, number two, the modernizing the nuclear triad. And number three was rebuilding the Navy. And what, what really concerns me are some of these comments that are now coming out of the Pentagon uh, that folks are stunned by uh, the 200 ICBM silos that China is building in the in Western China that they were somehow stunned uh, by the hypersonic uh, test. Uh, these, these were things that that Alex Gray and Matt Pottinger and I were pushing extraordinarily hard on the defense front uh, at the NSC. Uh, so, you know, the, we, we are moving forward to hypersonics. So there's, there's not a great defense uh, to hypersonic uh, weapons at this point, but, but deterrence is, the, uh, uh, is what we need to do. And we need to actually not just develop, but deploy our hypersonics. All those hypersonic programs were shut down for eight years during the Obama administration. And, and frankly, it didn't get a, a turbocharged until a, a group of us really pushed hard during the last two years of the Trump administration. Uh, what, what concerns me now is a, a comment that uh, John Noonan made, and I've heard this from other sources in the Pentagon as well, is that uh, on hypersonics, on modernizing the triad, and on rebuilding the Navy, uh, although the, the, the official policy hasn't changed, there's a lack of a sense of urgency uh, to do these things. And, and that lack of urgency uh, could, be, could be very dangerous uh, to the United States going forward. Uh, let me just mention on Europe, uh, both Nord Stream 2 and New Start were Vladimir Putin's number one and number two foreign policy objectives. Uh, we gave him both uh, of those uh, goals of his. And as far as I can tell, unless there's some secret accord that we haven't seen, some secret guarantee of Ukrainian uh, sovereignty, I mean, maybe, maybe there's a, uh, you know, some you know, old school uh, diplomatic uh, uh, note somewhere. But as far as we know, the West and the United States got nothing in return for giving Vladimir Putin his top two foreign policy objectives. Now, if the idea was to try and, and create a cleavage between China and Russia and break up that what was becoming a very uh, 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 tight military alliance, uh, if not an outright alliance, you know that would be one thing. But but we don't see any any progress on that. We don't see anything in return. Uh, and again, uh, John Noonan pointed out you know the, the, those issues and. But new, new start is, a, you know, we were prepared to do a one-year extension in return for a freeze of non-start compliant nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, the Biden administration didn't even take that, but new start becomes dangerous given the massive buildup of, of Chinese nuclear weapons. So we're, again, like we did with hypersonics and short-term missiles uh, or short-range missiles, we're tying our hands on the nuclear front. And, and we're going to face very shortly two adversaries with nuclear triads uh, that are that are as large or exceed the the uh, uh, in, independently uh, the total of, of U.S. nuclear weapons. And when it comes to uh, nuclear deterrence and, and and all those things we we learned about in the 80s and, and early 90s, uh, that's a, a bad place to be. Uh, briefly on the Middle East, uh, you know, it's unfortunate to see there, there's been very little. Uh, all of the Abraham Accords have not been uh, undermined to a large extent, other than you know, I guess by by the. Uh, desperation to to reenter the JCPOA. Uh, there's been no movement on on peace in the Middle East, and that's that's a shame because I think you know Mike knows this. I understand this. Uh, had President Trump been reelected, I think we would have had two or three additional countries, potentially even the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, joining the Abraham Accords, and we just haven't seen that. Uh, overall, and I'll, I'll wrap up here soon, so other other folks can comment. I want to hear from Secretary Pompeo. We've got a crisis of U.S. credibility. Uh, I think everybody touched on this in a way. I'm not going to get into Afghanistan, which we, we talked about at length, uh, but it was a, a catastrophe. And, and what, what the, the United States is not projecting is a peace through strength approach to the world, a, a peace through strength doctrine of national security. Uh, it's worked since Roman times. This isn't something the United States invented. Obviously, President Reagan 
uh, made it the centerpiece of his national security policy. It's uh, President Trump and and Secretary Pompeo and and, and myself made it the centerpiece of, of President Trump's, uh, you know, the, what I call it a Reagan Trump uh, approach to foreign policy, because the alternative is weakness, and weakness it isn't it, it, weakness isn't just uh, you know allowing the status quo to take place or allowing genocide to continue to take place in Western China or or the the, the Russians to to continue to move in in Eastern Europe and, and undermine democracies. It's it's actually provocative. Uh, it encourages uh, bad action and, and, and bad conduct and malign activity. And so uh, we, we've got to make sure that that even if if the, the the basic policies of the Trump administration, the legacy that Alex Gray talked about, uh, remains in place. Uh, if it, if it remain, remains in place, but it, but it, the United States looks weak uh, and, and is perceived as being weak, uh, even if we aren't, uh, that's extraordinarily dangerous. And then. You know the question is how do we how do we fix things, and and I'm an optimist. I, I I believe in the United States of America. I believe that we're the the last best hope for mankind. Uh, I, I I believe that uh, that God has a role for this country, as uh, as quaint as that uh, that may be uh, in in 2021. And, and I'll tell you, elections matter. And if we're going to get back to leading the free world, becoming the leading leader of the free world, if we're going to get back to a projecting a peace through strength. Uh, uh, posture to the world. Uh, we need to win in 2024, but first we need to win in 2022. We've got to take the House back. Appropriations bills begin in the House. Uh, we've got to appropriate money for the hypersonics. We've got to appropriate money to keep the F-22s, which the, the Air Force now is claiming they're going to uh, you know, start decommissioning before the next generation air defense fighter. Uh, we've got to appropriate money for a, a Navy uh, that's, that's sufficient to, to defend the United States and our partners and our allies. Uh, getting the House back, and, and I thought the Senate would probably be a little out of uh, out of reach, but I think, given the, uh, uh, the 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 way the polls look for for the president, uh, the current president, and and the uh, the difficulty there the, the Democrats are having, and the overreach that we're seeing, uh, the uh, uh, there's there's a good chance we take the Senate back as well. So I think I think the the best thing we can do, uh, and the best thing the American people can do, and this is what I tell folks when when they ask how do we how do we change things? Is is work like heck for the next year, and it looks like uh, from the from Twitter that uh, that Glenn Youngkin's going to be the next uh, governor of uh, of Virginia, which is which is great. Uh, but but I think that gives a lot of hope to uh, to folks on our side that if we can take back the House, if we can put Mike Waltz and Mike Gallagher in, in chairman or subcommittee chairman positions, uh, if, if we can get uh, uh, you know uh, real oversight of what's happening in the Pentagon. Uh, I, I think it will, it will make a huge difference. Election matters, and then, and then it puts us in a position in 2024 whether uh, President Trump runs for re-election, whether uh, you know Mike or uh, the Vice President or, or uh, Senator Cotton or, or the, the 20 others that are being mentioned uh, uh, become the next president. Any of them will be a, a, a you know a massive improvement over where we are now. So I think we I think the hope that we have is at the ballot box, and it's in 2022, and and we we start to uh, to, to change course. Uh, Within the next year, and, and it's going to be a lot of work for everybody on the on the seminar and uh, and all of our friends who are involved in politics around the uh, the country. So, with that, I'll hand off to Hugh and uh, Secretary Pompeo. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you get to bring us home on this. On a very good night, we're finishing a very bad year. It sounds like. What's your assessment? Well, thanks, you. Uh, let me let me second uh, Ambassador O'Brien's grace note with respect to Secretary Powell. He was a servant. And we, we should all pray for him and for his family. Uh, second, uh, Monica, you kicked it off incredibly well. We should also give uh, a props to you and Secretary Mnuchin and Treasury, who were part of this economic effort that we've talked about tonight, how we use American economic power. Uh, we're often in the same place. Um, I will say one, one of the places where I think there has been continuity, and I actually regret it, is that there needs to be a lot more work done on the financial side. It's the case that Wall Street and big financial companies and departments of Treasury, even in a Trump administration, are always less willing to do things that have to do with money with respect to China. We, we, I, I wish we had been able to do more. I wish we had accomplished more in that space. I, I regret these folks are probably going to uh, retrench from even where the Trump administration were when it comes to using the financial power that we have in the United States to really crush people being attorney in China. Uh, look, I had a long list. We've gone through many of them, but I had three uh, little ideas and then a couple big ones. 
a little one, it was not much noted what happened in Sudan over the past few weeks. Uh, that's that's un that's unfortunate. There was a structure there that was better than what it looks like it may be. I hope that the military will get this right and, and restore civil control in Sudan. It, it enabled us to make a peace deal with them. It allowed us to lift uh, the state designation of terror on them. Um, it's a small place, but an important place on the map in Africa and uh, extends certainly into the Arab world and the Middle East as well. Second, Congressman Waltz mentioned uh, Cuba. I, I would, ex I think he's spot on there. Uh, I, I think I would extend that even to all of our neighbors in South America. I want to know where the heck we went. Uh, the, the folks in Colombia are worried. The Brazilians are worried. Um, they, they think we, I, I can't think about the last time President Biden actually mentioned South American country as part of a priority, the, the agenda he was working on. And I think there's real risk in Mexico. And I'll talk about immigration in just a moment, how that's changed over the past year. We had a serious concerted effort to try and build out relationships that ran north-south, not just east-west. We had made real progress there. And I, I watch the Mexican government is now putting its energy sector at risk. It has massive pieces of real estate that are ungoverned. This is, this is not good for the United States of America and our security. Uh, last item, it's not particularly small, um, but important about this uh, continued use of economic power, but you can't shut down American energy and still think you have a prayer of using true Amer American economic power to formulate diplomacy around the world and use it as one of your key levers. So whether it was the abandonment of the Keystone XL pipeline or the Fed uh, drilling on federal lands or just the general idea that somehow fossil fuels are deeply disfavored, it is putting a real cap on American economic growth and thereby the capacity for us to use that energy for diplomatic ends that I used so powerfully under President Trump during our time. I can't tell you how many times I was in conversations in Eastern or Southern Europe or in Asia, and the thing they really wanted to know is going to get American LNG to them. How many? What was the what was the cost of crude fully delivered into their backyard? Turn the lights on for their people. Uh, second, and, and Ambassador Brian hit on this. I think the biggest change over the last year is the perception of American foreign policy. This has a first order impact in terms of how folks will be able to second order impact about what gets said in the, the, the secret meetings between countries that we aren't part of. They have come to be very skeptical about our willingness to actually defend the things that we declare as red lines, things that matter to the United States of America. And they're all wondering, will we really do that? Will we really do the things that have risk and cost to the United States it might help secure our freedom and theirs. That perception morphs into reality all too quickly. A final thought. You know, the, the campaign that ended roughly a year ago today was fought uh, over competence in so many ways, right? The administration said, we know how to make the levers of American power work. We're, we're the trained professionals. We all, we all went to the finest schools. We've all served multiple times in administrations. We know how to make the machine work. There's one thing we've learned in 10 months that is falling. It is fundamentally false. I, I can't tell you how many times I would read things that we were the barbarians. We were, we were naive. Goodness gracious, you had a secretary of state who was a soldier from Kansas. What the heck does he know about American diplomacy, right? The same story would be told for so many folks in our administration. Uh, no one believes these folks are coming actually execute whatever it is they say as their priority, and that's dangerous. That's really dangerous, because if you can't actually deliver, even if you have the intention to deliver, if you can't deliver American power, if you can't defend America's warfighting machine as fundamentally focused on warfighting, if you can't say that American diplomacy is fundamentally about protecting America, if you can't say, if you can't say that, my goodness gracious, we're not about to fold on New Start and a pipeline in the course of a matter of days in exchange for nothing. If you can't execute using the leverage available to us in America's power, in American exceptionalism, then you truly present real risk because in the end, it's not only what your policies are, it's the capacity to execute them. And, and, and we had our moments where we didn't have it exactly right either, but we demonstrated over the course of four years that if we met it and we said it, we were not only going to follow through on it, but we would deliver that. Last thought. Uh, the other thing that has changed and accelerated in this last year is the fundamental idea 
occupied by the progressive left of American self-loathing. I find this incredibly dangerous, not only from a security perspective, but more broadly to our republic. The idea that somehow we are a nation founded in a racist tradition, that we accept when the Chinese sit across the table from us and, and rant about BLM and riots in the United States of America, you have too many in our nation say, you know, we're just not going to build an iron dome to allow the Israelis to defend them. This is about, about self-loathing and apology. This does harken back to President Obama and his time. That central conceit that so many of our adversaries in the world want to spread and have propagate around the world is truly dangerous. And I think this administration, starting with the President of the United States, who often fall into the trap, aren't prepared to defend the greatness of the United States of America. When we do that, risk is manifold to you. And so with that, I'll close. Thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. It's been a great conversation. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I want to thank the members of the seminar, you and Ambassador O'Brien, for a great first year of the Nixon Foundation Nixon Seminar. We'll reconvene at the uh, first Tuesday in January, and I believe I've persuaded Mary Kissel to take over this job so you all have a much harder taskmaster come the new year in 2023. Enjoy and thank you and uh, join in the celebrations online, which are loud, noisy, and welcome. Thank you all and good night.